Uh, well, we are in a sermon series, uh, just started a sermon series studying the Lord's Prayer together. Um, let me get my notes out. And um, when, when we talk about prayer, um, there's, there's two dangers that we run into. The first is when we say anything over and over and over again, we're, we're in risk, at risk of not knowing why we say it. Uh, it reminds me of that scene in The Princess Bride when they're standing on the top of the cliff and the guy says, inconceivable, and Inigo Montoya says, uh, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means, right? Just because you say something over and over and over again or you've said it your whole life, it doesn't mean that you know what you're saying. And so if that's you, that really gives you two options. First, you can stop saying it to live with integrity, or you can be curious and investigate and figure it out what these words mean that you're saying in prayer. And the second, um, the second danger is that if you're not a Christian, uh, prayer can feel strange. If you're, if you're with us and you're looking in, prayer can feel or look strange. I mean, we talked about this last week. It can feel like you're just like saying stuff up to the sky. Like, what do these words really mean? Um, maybe it feels a bit like Harry Potter in their spell class. Like, they got to get the words just right to make the magic happen. And so, as a non-Christian looking in, are you saying, like, what, are, are Christians just reciting magic words when they pray? I mean, what is happening when Christians pray? And as we said last week, the primary goal of prayer, it's not saying the right words to get blessings from the sky. The primary goal of prayer is connection with God. It's life with God. Prayer is how we experience God as our Father. Prayer is the joyful grateful, worshipful enjoyment of the Father's company. So as we study the Lord's Prayer together over the next few weeks, we're going to take one of the petitions each week, one of these phrases, consider it together. Last week we looked at our Father, and this week we're going to look at the phrase, hallowed be thy name. So I invite you now to stand for the reading of God's Word. I don't have my large Bible. I, this is the Bible I have this morning. It's very small. Um, but this is, it's still God's Word. This is God's Word for us this morning. It is trustworthy, and it's true, and he gives it to us in love. We're reading Matthew 6, verse 5 through 15. This is Jesus speaking. He says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you'll pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you uh, for this morning. Thank you that you give us a day to gather and to worship and to praise you and to hear from your word. And so, Lord, now we come... And Lord, we bring ourselves to you and ask that you would speak. Um, Lord, teach us to pray, teach us to praise. I invite you to take a moment now for yourself to pray, to prepare your heart to receive um, from, for what God has to speak to you this morning. And would you pray for those who are sitting around you? And would you pray for me? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this phrase, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be your name. Hallowed is not a common word. It's not a word that we use regularly. Um, it's an old word, but still many Bible translators have chosen to keep this word in our modern translations. And the reason is because it's, it's a word that, that contemporary English words really don't capture the full weight of what it, what it carries. It's this word um, that means to, for something to be sacred, to, to honor it as sacred, to honor it as holy. Um, but we do have this word in our vocabulary, right? Thursday is Halloween, um, which is this old, it's an old word that um, it's the day before All Saints Day, which is an ancient feast day in the church, which it used to be called All Hallows Day. And so Halloween is All Hallows Eve turned into Halloween. I asked my kids, do you know this word? And they said, yeah, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Like, so it's kind of in our vocabulary, but we don't know what it means when we say it. 
So what does it mean? It means sacred or holy. Anything that's hallowed is something to be praised. So as we look at this word this morning, we're going to ask two questions. First, what is praise? And second, why should we praise? So first, what is praise? We all know what praise is. I mean, praise is the high five that you get when you come off the field. It's the the pat on the back, the attaboy. It can be a gift. It can be an award that you receive at a ceremony. I mean, it's the stadium roaring after a big play. It's a standing ovation at a concert. We praise all the time. We know how to praise. Well, if we do it all the time, why is it hard for us to praise God? Why do we struggle to be specific in our, our articulation of our praise to God? I was talking with a friend about this, and he said, it's because you only praise what you know. And there's two ways to know someone or something, through their character and through their actions. So first, character. Those of you who are young and single, I mean, think about how your friends try to set you up on dates. What do they say? They say, oh, you will love him. You will love her. And then they start praising the person's character. She's just so, she's so funny. He's so interesting. He's so, char- he's so caring. He's so fun to be with. I mean, they're praising the person's character. I mean, this is, right, this is how you try to set up your friends, is by praising the other person's character. And you have to know their character to praise them. Um, We know this, right? Like, if you ask me about my kids, what's praiseworthy about them, and this is true for all of us as parents, all right, you won't be able to shut me up. I wish that we still had those old wallets with the um, plastic picture things. You could open your wallet and be like, oh, you want to know about my kids? And, you know, it falls out. Because now, right, proud dads, what do we do? We pull out our phones, we open our photo app, and like, let me show you the videos and the pictures of my kids. We gush over our kids. One of the easiest and most fun ways to get to know someone is to ask them about what they love. You know, their spouse, if they're married, their kids, if they have children, and they will open up and just gush. Their hearts will pour out through their mouths. Why? Because they are intimately knowledgeable about their character, the story and personalities of their families. When you adore God, you can praise Him in detail. You can marvel at the glories of His grace and the riches of of his redemption, and the splendor of his steadfastness. And if you don't know him, or you don't know his character, you can't do that. And if you can't do that, then it's telling, because you don't actually know the full character of God. Um, The spring of my junior year of college, I studied abroad at the University of Edinburgh and was a part of a, a Christian community there of students called the Christian Union. And that group of students taught me how to praise. They would do this thing, I think, fairly regularly where they meet in somebody's apartment, they're flat, and they would um, like sit or kneel or lie down and just do this like alphabetical praise of God. Walk through the alphabet praising God's name. Almighty, awesome, abundant in love, benevolent, beautiful, bread of life, compassionate, creator, comforter, deliverer, defender. This is who your God is. Eternal, Emmanuel, everlasting Father, forgiving and faithful, gracious, a good God, holy, healer, my only hope, immutable, infinite, intimate, the great I am. He's just and joyful and a judge, king of king, Lord of lords, merciful, mighty, majestic, the name above all names, omnipotent and omniscient, patient, provider, prince of peace, quick to forgive, righteous, refuge and redeemer, sovereign, savior and shepherd, trustworthy and true, unchanging, victorious and vigilant, the true vine. He's wise and worthy. He's your wonderful counselor, excellent and exalted Yahweh, zealous Zion's king, the zenith of glory. When you know his character, you can praise him. So we know people through their character, and we know people through their actions. If I got invited to an Auburn football game, I'm going to struggle to praise Auburn. No, not because because I don't know Auburn, not because I don't like them, because I don't know Auburn. I don't know the history of the program. I don't know the stats of the players. I mean, some of you who are Auburn fans are thinking, man, I want to tell John about the glories of Auburn football. I want him to know the stories and the stats and the people so he can watch Auburn football with me and praise Auburn. So insert insert your school here, right? Tennessee, Alabama, Vandy, Oregon, Indiana, wherever you went to school, I would love for you to teach me. I would love to learn your love of your team with you so I can praise your team with you. But 
in order for me to give praise to the thing that you love, I need to know its actions. To praise God, you need to know his actions towards you, to be able to articulate his wisdom towards you, his intervention in your own life, his intervention in human history, right? how patient he's been with you, how sweet his grace has been to you, how he's secured your salvation, how you can't out his grace. Now, in order to do this, you need to know yourself. You need to know your own story, your own sin, your own struggles and patterns so that you can ask, why do I need salvation? Why do I need God's gracious intervention? So how do you do this? How do you get to know yourself and know God? Well, you need to carve out time. Um, C.S. Lewis wrote, he said, if you want to avoid God, avoid silence, avoid solitude, avoid any train of thought that leads off the beaten track. Concentrate on money, sex, status, health, above all, on your own grievances. Keep the radio on, live in a crowd, use plenty of sedation. Live in a, he said, keep the radio on, the radio. This is anything that we keep in our ears so that we don't have to deal with ourselves in silence and solitude. So we don't have to deal with God and silence and solitude. So question for you, is there any moment in your day where there isn't noise on? And can you turn off the noise? Do you turn off the noise? I mean, you might be thinking, how, John? My life is crazy. I I can't even go to the bathroom without my kids bothering me. How do I get time to pray? Um, I'll tell you a story about Susanna Wesley. Uh, This is a woman who had 11 children, uh, two of which who would go on to impact millions for the gospel, these these boys, John and Charles Wesley. Um, And among the noise of her 11 children... Susanna's trick, her famous trick, was that she would pull her apron over her head. She'd basically hide under a piece of cloth. And this was signaling to her children and anyone in their little one-room house that she was in prayer and not to be disturbed. So I'm not telling you to hide in your shirt, um, but I guess I'm telling you the story to say, be creative. Like, you can turn off the noise. You can figure out how to do that in your own life. I mean, when was the last time you actually turned off your phone? Not just put it in, do not disturb, but actually turned it off. We can do this. We can turn off the noise. Because if you don't turn off the noise, you're not going to be able to have self-knowledge. And without self-knowledge, you're never going to know how great your sin is, how deep your need is, and how abundant God's provision is for you, the depths of his delight in you. So what do we praise? We praise God's character and his actions. Second, why should we praise? Um, Why should you care about what you praise? So three things, order, joy, and mission. First, order. You should praise God because praise orders our lives. I said this last week that um, this, in Luke's gospel, uh, the only only place in the entire Bible where Jesus' disciples ask him to teach us, teach us to do something. And Jesus puts praise first. Before anything else, before bread, before forgiveness, he puts praise And notice, Jesus doesn't get to asking God for for needs or wants until halfway through the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, most of us start there, right? Say, God, I need this, I need that. And this, we all have our list. This isn't bad, but sometimes prayer can feel like we're just reading our, you know, our list to Santa. Um, So why does Jesus put praise before anything else, before forgiveness? Well, Jesus is telling us that there's something important about the order um, he puts praise force, his praise first, and we get this inverted, right? When we ask for things, for help, intervention, bread, forgiveness, deliverance, protection, they're all good things, but when we ask for these things without first praising God, then our hearts get disordered, and we end up loving those things first, loving those things more than him, and then we get hurt, and we get hurt because we think God isn't listening to us in the moment when he doesn't answer these prayers, a friend of mine says that when this happens, what's happening is that we, we have an adoration problem. We have a praise problem. Like, let's say, for example, there's a job that you wanted that you didn't get, or there's a relationship that you want to be in, but it's, it's just not happening. That's actually not the thing that you need the most. You see, if you know God as your Father, if you have Him as your Father, even if you don't get the things that you want when you want them, you still have what you need the most. You have Him praising him, praising him actually heals you because of no matter what goes wrong, what happens, he doesn't change, right? The cross doesn't change. The ongoing work of his spirit in your life and in the church doesn't change. Praise comes first. Let's apply this 
I mean, how many of us, don't raise your hands, but how many of us have ever thought or felt, I can't forgive myself? Something you've done, something you can't forgive yourself of, it still weighs you down with guilt and shame. Now, when we hear somebody say this, we hear somebody say, I can't forgive myself, I think our first thought is often something like, wow, man, that guy's so humble. He's so humble. He feels so bad about what he's done, he can't forgive himself. But that's actually not what's going on. See, what's going on is that you're actually prioritizing something above God's name. You're prioritizing your name over God's. See, when you praise God for who he is, what he's done for you, his character, his actions, you live in the reality of his perfect forgiveness, and this heals your heart. And if you can't forgive yourself, it's because something else has a hold on your heart. I mean, maybe it's your own reputation. Maybe you can't forgive yourself because your sin hurt your reputation, and that's number one for you. Maybe it's your parents' approval. Maybe you can't forgive yourself because whatever that sin is, it went against something that your parents spoke into you when you were a kid, and you can't forgive yourself because you did something that goes against your parents' approval, and that's number one for you. Here's the thing. I think that we are so full of shame and so terrible at forgiving others, unable to, unable to forgive ourselves for one reason, because our hearts are not full of praise for God. I mean, do you have a judgmental heart, a condemning heart? Like you can't help but always put other people in their place, always tell them what they're doing wrong, what they can do better. I mean, even if you never say it out loud, this is always going on in your heart. Well, do you spend time praising God, praising God for his forgiveness of you? I mean, that's the only thing that's going to heal your condemning heart, your judgmental heart. Or do you have a hurt heart? If you praise him, it will heal your heart over time. Do you have an anxious heart? Are you always worried about the future? If you praise him, it will heal your heart over time. Like I said, this is the inverse of how we pray. We often start at the end, right? Deliver us from evil. We say, God, we pray for safety. Lead us not into temptation. Help me be good. Help me have a good day. Forgive us. I'm sorry. I can't get over my guilt. Help me know I'm forgiven and the other people too. Um, give us our bread. They say, well, God, here's the stuff that I want, the stuff I think I need, the stuff that will make my life go the way I want it to. And then when we're praying, we get to God if we have time. We say, thy will be gone. But of course, your will, God, and thy kingdom come. And yes, I want your kingdom, God, even though I've spent most of the time asking for my own kingdom. And then maybe if we have time, we get to hallowed be your name. Maybe we'll say something about his character and his actions at the end, right? Um, I've heard it said, this is the prayer of the American middle class. This is the inverse of how Jesus taught to pray. It starts with me and it ends with God. Opposite of how Jesus taught us to pray, starting with God and ending with me. As all of you know, um, I have a funny last name. Um, people love to ask me if I know what I, my name means. Of course I know what my name means. Uh, but whether they want to talk to me about like 19th century politics or French etymology, people love to say, do you know what your name means? We were out to dinner recently and the waiter was confident that I didn't know what my name meant. And so he took time to explain to me uh, what my name was. Um, one time we ordered uh, pizza as a family and I you know, called the pizza place. What's your name? I said, bourgeois. I went to go pick up the pizza and on the side of the box was written middle class. It's like, that's a clever pizza guy. <laughs> Here's the thing. In order for me to pray as Jesus taught me to pray, I literally have to repent of my last name. I literally have to do the opposite of the name that I've said and I've heard my entire life. So what labels, what names do you willingly let others give you that you give to yourself that teach you to pray this prayer upside down, right? to put the praise of God not at the top but at the end of the prayer or anywhere but first in your prayer? What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about your life in the world that causes you to start your prayers with God, we pray for safety. God, help me be good. Help me have a good day. So much of Christianity in this country is praying like a bourgeois. Don't pray a bourgeois prayer. Pray a Jesus prayer. Join me in my repentance of my last name. Hallowing God's name will free you. It will heal you. It will reorder your heart and your mind. It will set you free. It will give you a new order. And it will give you joy. All over the Bible, God says, you should praise my name. All over the Psalms, 
Why does God need us to praise him? Have you ever thought this? Like, is, why, why does he need this? Is God a megalomaniac? Is this like an ego trip for him? Or we think about heaven and we say, like, I've heard that heaven is just people sitting around singing and praising God all the time. That sounds so boring. Like, if he's God, why does he need my praise? And if that's who God is, if he needs your praise, I agree with you. But that's not what praise is about. When I go for a hike in the mountains and I praise, I'm not bored, right? I'm overwhelmed of the beauty of what I see. I'm praising the beauty. And when, when you listen to your favorite song, when you've got it on repeat for weeks and you wear it out, you're not bored, right? You're immensing yourself in its beauty, immersing yourself in its beauty. You're memorizing the lyrics. You're praising its beauty. You're not bored. I mean, this is true for everything we praise, whether you eat a great meal or when you play a sport, or you go to a football game, or you get to dance, or you get to sing and perform a song, or read your favorite book, or you watch an awesome movie, or stargaze, whatever it is that's beautiful and praiseworthy, when you praise it, your praise makes it complete. Your praise of the thing completes its beauty. The experience of enjoying the beauty of beauty completes the beauty. Right? This is the difference between listening to Taylor Swift in your bedroom and learning the lyrics and singing at the top of your lungs at Nissan Stadium. Participation in beauty completes the beauty. And this is why we clap, because praising makes the beautiful thing complete. We want to participate in the beauty we experience and enjoy and praising it and participating in it completes it. Real praise, it doesn't just acknowledge beauty, but it participates and it becomes part of it. I mean, this is what marriage is. You meet someone, you find them beautiful, their character, their actions, you praise them, you want to express your love, complete your love, participate in their beauty. This is what marriage is. And we praise God, not because he needs our compliments, but because our joy is made complete in him. And if God created all things, then all things you're praising right now are going to find their ultimate fulfillment in him. Joy is only complete in him. This means that we go to God to get God. You praise God to enjoy him. You don't just go to him to get things, but to get him. And y'all, this is why we sing and worship. We're commanded in scripture. Why? It's for his enjoyment and for your joy. It's for our joy. Um, there's a pastor named Alistair Begg, who's a Scottish man, and I heard him teach on singing. And he said, he said, American men don't sing in church. And he said, the reason that American, yes, and he said, the reason American men don't sing in church is because nobody taught us. He said, in the UK, men sing all the time, right? At football matches, they're always singing. In the pubs, they're always singing. And so when a man in the UK comes to faith, when, he, when he's converted to Christ, he already knows how to sing. And so singing like heartily in the church is just part of what it means to be a man for him. But in America, at our sports, there's no singing. Like I was thinking, what do we, what's, what do we sing at football games? I think we just like uh, sing the, the, the bass line for Seven Nation Army. Da, 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 da. Like that's it for men singing. At, right? That's all we know how to do. So you get converted out of the culture, you come to the church and like we don't know how to sing. So men, we have extra work to do. We have to go through man rehab. We have to learn how to sing so that we can access this joy and experience it and participate in it and so that we can share it with one another. So order, joy, and finally, mission. You should care about what you praise because praise, what you praise, drives your life. I heard a story this week about the Welsh revival. Um, in 1905, in the small country of Wales, a, a revival broke out. And then in villages across the countryside, people were packing into these tiny churches and they're singing together. And in one tiny Welsh church, people were crowding in, they're hanging out of the windows and they're all sitting on the floor packing into this little church. And then they sang this one song and they sang it for hours. They sang this hymn, um, Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean. Um, it's a song I love. We should, we should sing. We'll sing it soon. Um, uh, it's this beautiful, powerful song and it broke out in this tiny church. They sung it for hours thousands came to know the Lord, and then thousands were sent out on mission, out to the mission field. They're sent out around the world with the name of Jesus in their hearts and on their lips. Um, last month uh, in Seoul, South Korea, there was a global evangelism conference called the Luzan Congress, and Christians from around the world were there. 200 
nations were represented at this conference, and what they're doing is they're checking in on the state of the Great Commission. Jesus is commissioned to his church in Matthew 28 to go into all nations, to make disciples of all nations, say, how are we doing? How are we doing on this? And the modern church in Korea began in 1905, when one of these Welshmen took the gospel to Pyongyang, which was then when, when Korea was unified. And upon arrival with the gospel, he was martyred. They killed him, and then they tore the pages out of his Bible, and they plastered it on the wall. They used it as wallpaper. And then people began to read those pages, and people began to be converted. This is the beginning of the Korean church, the power of the Word of God. And they were so overwhelmed with the gift of salvation that came to him through this Welsh martyr, and so grateful for his gift that the church in Korea funded a seminary in Wales in his honor. And so when they met last month, 120 years after the Welsh revival, there was a group at Luzanne that, didn't sing, that sang the song, Here is Love, not in English, but in Welsh. Prayer is the engine for mission. Order, joy, and mission. This is why you should do it. This is why you should praise God, why you should hallow his name. And it will change everything you do. It'll change how you see everything. I know it's not easy. It takes time and practice and intentionality. And if you're beginning to do this for the first time, I'll give you one word of how to do it. Gaze. Gaze on his beauty. Long for his beauty. Memorize it so that you have it with you wherever you go. Sear it onto your heart. Don't settle for God as an idea. Let him become the love of your life. How do you do this? Prayer. Prayer. I'm going to close with this. Um, Thursday night, as Jay mentioned, uh, many of you were here, we launched the ministry of Celebrate Recovery here at West End. And uh, this is a ministry that helps people who have hurts, habits, and hang-ups, so really all of us, um, come into a life of repentance and healing from their, uh, the stuff that's, that's, that's bond, binding them and weighing them down. And let me tell you, the worship in this room on Thursday night was so powerful because it was filled with people who knew the character and action of God, people who had been to the bottom and met Jesus there, and he had healed them and restored them and forgiven them. And so to be in this room celebrating, worshiping with these people, so beautiful to see how praise healed them. If, you, if this is something in your life where you're like, man, I don't really get this. I want to learn how to praise. Yeah, John, you said gaze. What should I do? Come and worship on Sunday mornings. Come join us on Thursday nights. Come see the power of praise to heal, to see how it is that God restores us and reorders our lives and gives joy and propels us on mission. Praising him alone can do it. In John 4, Jesus is meeting with a woman at a well, and she's searching. She's, she's searching, she's looking, she's seeking, and Jesus tells her, true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such people to worship him. If you're here this morning, it's not an accident. Do you want to know him? Do you want him to bring order to your chaos? Do you want him to give you a joy that fulfills beyond measure to propel you into a mission that is more profound than your greatest ambitions? All this is yours in Jesus. Praise him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you give us this, these words and this command. You've made us to praise you. So, Lord, we ask, um, teach us. Teach us to pray, teach us to praise that you would receive glory in your church. We pray in Christ's name, amen.